Hi, welcome to the Lead and Thrive podcast. This is Daniel Torres Dwyer, your host here at Dwyer Partners. As you probably know, in this podcast, we speak everything about consumer goods and retail with the leaders that are shaping this industry day to day. Uh, today, I have the pleasure to introduce our guest, Fabio Grazioli, supply chain leader at BSH, to discuss everything around the current role supply chain has about the sales and operations process and how this function is gaining centrality through this process and other business initiatives such as direct to consumer. Fabio, thanks for joining the show. How are you? Uh, my pleasure. Thank you for having me here. Everything is great going through the pandemic, all the yeah. disaster. So there is a lot of movement in the market. I think you're joining us from Istanbul, right? Not really. I'm in Italy right now because I'm waiting for the vaccination from uh, my home country. Then I will ah, get Oh, yeah, that. you are. You are. Are they going faster in Italy as, uh, than in Turkey right now? Or is it just easier? Yeah, since I am an Italian citizen, it's quite easier for me to get it here. Okay. Then so, I'm taking the chance to visit my family a little bit. Nice. Is this the first time that you do so since the beginning of this mess or did you go there last year? You are right. It's the first time in two years that I'm seeing my relatives, my old house, everything. Wow. Who would have said that that would affect <laughs> in the past? Goodness. But, you know, with the fact that nowadays most of the business is managed through home office uh, is not actually a problem. It's just a matter of time zone, but you can manage easily. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I, I agree. I agree. I mean, as you know, I've been in the Americas the last few weeks and I was able to manage it well as well. So even some things in Asia. So imagine just for the audience to get some some context, Fabio, and obviously they can check you on LinkedIn, but maybe you can give us a bit of an introduction of yourself and what you currently do. I work in supply chain. Today, I'm managing the supply chain uh, in BSH, the home appliance company. I'm accountable for the region emerging market that goes for the Asian countries, Turkey, Russia, and Africa. Before I was working for Whirlpool Corporation, I took different roles in 10 years from procurement EMEA and the supply chain for EMEA. So I have fairly 10, 15 years of experience in the end-to-end -end supply chain scenario. You know, you can define, and we can define supply chain in many different ways. For someone is just planning, for someone is logistic, for in other companies is procurement. So I touched all the different aspects in my career for the end-to-end -end supply chain, from sourcing to delivery. And now, currently, obviously, you're, you have one of the main roles in BSH for supply chain, managing like yeah, emerging markets, which I'm sure is quite a big part of the company. Going back, how did you get into supply chain? Because I know you had an unusual start to your career compared to other people. I believe by chance, by <laughs> chance. I joined S.C. Johnson as uh, responsible for uh, production planning for third parties. And uh, I did realize uh, how supply chain, logistic and planning uh, was important because, uh, you know, selling is just uh, half of the battle. The second part of the battle that uh, most of the time is disregarded is delivering whatever is happening in the back office, capturing the order, making sure that you follow up with your customer and consumers, and then uh, you move all the supply chain to deliver things. And uh, since uh, it was so ever-changing, uh, always full of challenges, and every time you wake up in the morning, you don't know what is going to happen. Maybe a factory is breaking down in some part of, in any country, or uh, some customer is changing because they have a promotion. So it was such a dynamic environment that I fell in love. And then step by step, I climbed the ladders and I managed supply chain for different companies. And I did realize that supply chain has different meanings, different importance in different companies and in different cultures. And that uh, is something that I'm bringing with me all the time. Mm -hmm. What were you actually doing like day to day in your first job in supply chain in at SCJ? In SCJ, every morning I was downloading the sales plan and I was accountable to fulfill all the warehouses of Europe for the products that were in my competence from roughly 30 suppliers that were spread across the globe. 
So I was preparing the plan for the suppliers. I was discussing with them the bottlenecks and I was making sure that every single warehouse was fulfilled at the right level of service. So it was a continuous interaction with the sales development because SEJ had a time to market very short. So we were launching every week new products across Europe and with all the suppliers. And slowly I built up the capability of diplomacy because you need always to bring together all the different functions in the company for the common objective that is selling and delivering and the skill to take uh, tough decisions because Mm -hmm. sometimes you don't have someone to refer to and maybe a production plan is stopping all of a sudden and you need to decide how to split what you can produce between different markets. So always taking the decision and then be able to substantiate it afterwards. So that was the how dynamic the environment was at that time. And that was what made me fall in love with this crazy world that is supply chain. <laughs> Do you feel like the supply chain, so you started at SCJ in 2002, so practically you're reaching your 20-year anniversary there, Fabio? Yeah, uh, you're right. Do you feel like supply chain has changed as a function per se? Like the way that supply chain, if we look at it as a silo, has it changed over time? I feel that uh, it changed dramatically and uh, is still changing. And that uh, is not because we need to change it, but because the market itself uh, is completely changing. Today, well, 20 years ago, the product was really important. And most of the industries were selling to retailers or to a third party. Nowadays, we see how the direct-to-consumer is important and how many companies are working online through marketplaces or going directly to the consumer. So you see how it's not only the product, but the service that you provide with the product that is becoming an important piece of the consumer experience and the consumer journey. It's not enough to build up a fancy website and sell things. Mm -hmm. You need to have all the back office. You need to show when you're going to sell, when you're going to ship, when you're going to deliver, what products are available. So connecting all the functions together and all the information from the back office to the front office, requires completely different supply chain. A supply chain that today is more and more integrated from the order to the delivery process and is collaborating to a very different level with all the different functions. And uh, by different function, I mean operation, so the actual factory that uh, is producing, mm-hmm. all the logistic, all the sales, the customer service, and even the customer for a collaborative planning, for instance. And more and more is the skill that uh, supply chain requires is uh, not to think like only operation, but think like a salesperson. Mm -hmm. So how we can provide value to our customer and in many cases to our hand consumer. So dramatically changed. And that goes with the role of supply chain. 20 years ago, from my experience, Most of the supply chain roles and or supply chain interpretation in the companies was a transactional expertise. You had sales that was owning the inventories, the factory that was deciding what to produce. And in the middle, you had a small function that was only accountable to move goods in the cheapest and fastest way as possible. Mm -hmm. Today, through the new processes that have been growing, like the SNOP, the role of supply chain is the group that is connecting all the different functions in an end-to-end enterprise and that is the right hand of the CEO because, again, selling is just half of the pie. Today, with online direct-to-consumer, delivering and customer experience through the supply chain capabilities is as important as the product. So it's a completely different job, I believe. Well, interesting. I saw that you actually, now that you mentioned SNOP, you recently shared an article about SNOP. I mean, how important is SNOP 
and maybe we should define uh, yeah. this NLP and probably better you than me. Was that <laughs> was not was not uh, one of my articles. Yeah, yeah, I, know. I was really thrilled that it was coming from the Institute of Business Forecasting and Planning. That uh, mm -hmm. is uh, kind of the mecca of uh, supply chain forecasting and planning uh, for all the experts. And the article really resonated to me because I saw all the discussion, the battles that I had during these 20 years with uh, executives or counterparts from operation or from sales about uh, what should be the role of the SNOP. You know, usually supply chain is always in a tight spot because uh, when the company is not selling, there is always someone that is blaming supply chain because you don't have the products, maybe. Uh -huh. Because maybe you don't have the delivery. And then the supply chain would answer easily, yes, but you gave me the wrong forecast, so you cannot have the right products because we are always struggling with the forecast accuracy. So inside the company, there is an endless battle about who is responsible for the trouble, while the solution should be how we can cooperate together for our customer, so having more a focus to the customer. And the SNOP is exactly the process that yeah, should be helping us. The SNOP should be, and that is the aim of the process, the right vehicle that uh, is bringing all the counterparts in the company together to share information, aligning the demand, so what the sales want to sell, what the customer wants, with the supply, so what you can produce in the mid-long term to make sure that everything flows uh, in the right way. So uh, the SNOP is the process that is really bringing people together. Mm -hmm. And that is requiring uh, supply chain experts that are not only crunching the numbers and uh, booking trucks and uh, shipping trucks as cheap as possible, but is requiring uh, supply chain experts that are able to negotiate, to inform, to have the right upward communication, to bring together all the different parts and functions of the company to the right consensus, and sometimes even taking tough decisions. The SNOP is a process where you align the demand and the supply in 18, 24 months in the future. You look so in the short term, how you make the month, but at the same time, how you will be prepared in the long term to follow the future. So sometimes you need to take challenges. Shall we open a new warehouse? Shall we distribute our constrained demand between different markets in different ways? So you find supply chain being in the right spot, helping the CEO and the board to take the right decision. Shall we open a new factory? Maybe today we don't need it, but in two years from now, we might need it. Mm -hmm. And the SNP is the process to make it happen. And when I went through that article, I really saw many misconceptions that many times came to me. SNP is just a supply chain thing. It's not because for what we just said, is a tool to take decision, is a process for the company. So it's not just a supply chain thing. It is a sales thing, is an operation thing, yeah. is a CEO and CFO thing, because if we need to make a financial forecast, should be aligned with the SNOP with one number policy. What we think we're going to sell it should be what should be our forecast. And it's not only about numbers, it's about taking and analyzing different scenarios. And it's not just about a forecast. And this goes again that uh, is not uh, just a, a reporting, is a process where starting from where the demand is built up in the market, people are coming together, are discussing how the demand should be, putting together the promotions, uh, the external market effects. They are discussing it with the operation. So operation, can you build up what I need? And the operation should have the right capabilities or advise if they cannot and then coming together to build up the best action plan for the company to deliver the company objectives. So who is owning the SNOP? All the company. Who is driving it? The supply chain. And uh, to do that, you see how different the skills are versus uh, 20 years ago. You need a supply chain executive that uh, is thinking like a salesperson 
to discuss with salespeople. And, uh, you know, it's funny, in the last transformation, for two years, uh, when we have been revising the SNOP, I kept on repeating to everybody, uh-huh. we get a salary only because we sell, not because we produce. Because I'm talking too much maybe, but, you know, for operation, oh, if, you manage, if you manage operation by yourself, uh, you think that you are good if you are efficient as much as possible. So to be efficient, you limit the number of setup in your production line. So you tend to produce massive batches of products. But that is not aligned with what the customer wants. So you see that through the SNOP, you need to bring everything together and think that we need to create value for, for the consumer. So we need to have the right batches, the right warehousing, the right forecasting to provide that value. Because at the end of the day, we get a salary because we sell and we build up a sustainable growth. That's Can the it. company survive or operate uh, without an SNOP process, do you think? Because it does feel like, it does seem like it's pretty essential. Honestly, I believe that the company can survive because uh, I've been in companies where we had an SNOP or we called it an SNOP, but it actually wasn't. Uh-huh. But uh, I believe that it's becoming harder and harder. Why? Because 10 years ago, you can take one year for planning and another year for executing anything. Today, things are changing very fast and things are becoming really volatile. You wake up in the morning and you don't have containers and there is a global crisis for containers because uh, a ship is wrecked uh, in the Suez Canal. Or you wake up, you have a pandemic that has completely changed the demand shape and the order intake in every single country. So without a tool that is... uh, helping the company to bring all the functions together, you really risk to forget that the enemy is outside and you tend to build up battles inside who is responsible for the stock out, who is responsible for the missed sales and people are just fighting. Yeah. So I believe that is becoming really harder and harder. Then depends on the market, but it's visible that direct-to-consumer, online marketplaces are affecting more or less everything nowadays, isn't it? Yeah, no, absolutely. Do you think it's, I've done a lot of planning roles and SNOP roles, and in a lot of cases, my client would come to me saying, look, we have an SNOP process, but it doesn't work. Like it's basically dysfunctional. Is it better to not have an SNOP process at all? Or is it better to have a minimum more than anything? And I'm sure that you've encountered some situations like that. You know, half of a process is always better than nothing. But again, goes uh, the process should be aligned with the ambition that the company has for the supply chain. If we are fine that what we call supply chain is a team of people that just need to book trucks and find the cheapest truck to deliver, who cares about the SNOP? If we believe that the delivery and the performance of the delivery is uh, an important part of the value of the product to our customer, then supply chain has a different role. It's not just an executor, but is the team of experts that is connecting end-to-end the entire company. That means that uh, supply chain negotiates with sales, the level of service, and the supply chain owns the inventory and all the tools to deliver that level of service. If you go back to a simple executor, sales is owning the inventory, and sales is telling me what to ship. Mm -hmm. is a completely different job. But then you cannot build up online markets, you cannot build up direct-to-consumer because uh, the sales organization do not have those type of capabilities. You need to bring all those capabilities together to have the right critical mass, and then you have a supply chain. So with that said, basically... Am I convincing? (laughs) Yeah, no, well, basically what you're saying is that a company can't be serious about like modernizing their approach to customer or or building direct-to-consumer capabilities unless supply chain has a a seat on the table and has a strategic function, no? And has a say in in very strategic decisions. Yep. Mm -hmm. How have you, Fabio, personally been able to make SNOP work in a company, like through your personal leadership style or, I mean, what's your, uh, yeah, personally as a leader, how have you been able to achieve certain things in, in supply chain and specifically in SNOP? For my experience, I believe that the crucial thing was visibility Mm -hmm. and transparency. 
since you are connecting many function and most of the time supply chain is inside operation, it's really tempting uh, to refine a little bit the numbers to make things better or to strengthen some position. Uh-huh. But then uh, you're not transparent. And uh, it's always easy to think, uh, I don't tell to sales that I have a problem because as soon as I say, I tell to sales that I have a problem, it always happens that sales uh, will try to order what I cannot produce. <laughs> no? Just to say that they cannot sell because they don't have the products. No? Got it. Uh, you see, it's a, it's a chicken and egg discussion. Yeah. But if you're really able to be transparent and you really put yourself into a weak position to say, this is the reality, this is what we have. This is the demand with uh, its pros and cons and uncertainty and variability. This is what we can do in production. Then you always find, in most of the cases, executives from sales and operation and finance that are working for the company and they are always able to take the right decision together. So the right way of making it work to me was uh, build up transparency with the clear KPIs and then uh, bring the people to the table uh, to take decisions. And it's not always easy. You know, once I took the decision, despite everybody was recommending me not to do, to have all the CEOs of all the markets coming mm-hmm. together for a pre SNOP meeting. So we come together, we show the reality, and we discuss together. And they told me, they're going to slaughter you. Actually, they slaughtered me the first half an hour of the first meeting. <laughs> but right after, they did recognize that I was there to drive the success of the company. And when we were deciding together to give more goods maybe to France instead of Portugal, because there was more marginality, okay, the boss of Portugal was not happy, but at least he knew the reason why. And he knew that I was there to protect the reality of the decision in the interest of the company. So right after, in few months and sessions, we all came together with the right purpose. All of a sudden, all the emails that were running to the CEO or in different channels or at the coffee machine disappeared because there was a visible, transparent process that I was endorsing and managing where we spoke the reality with only one thing in mind, our customer and consumer Mm -hmm. and the benefit of the company. Mm -hmm. Any mistakes that you would recommend other leaders to avoid? Because obviously, it's, this is, we're not talking about supply chain here. We're talking about influencing and showing people the benefit of something and managing people that don't report into you. So it's super complex. And I'm sure that you've made a lot of mistakes on the way. Any, any ones that you would recommend to avoid if possible? By DNA, from my experience, I was grown up in supply chain thinking that salespeople were my enemies because uh, they were the guys always forging the wrong forecast, always trying to sell whatever they never asked to me or always trying to order the wrong thing. So they are reliable guys. And the mistake that I did in the past was always fighting with them saying, you made the wrong forecast, so it is your fault. Uh Uh-huh. And that was bringing the company nowhere. So nowadays, I see more successful, sometimes even not caring about the forecast accuracy. Because uh, obviously, I work with the salespeople to improve their forecasting capabilities, but they do know that regardless their forecast, we will always try to do together the best for the company. And that is was really changing uh, the way I was perceived by salespeople because they saw that I was thinking like a salesman. Mm -hmm. Oh, very interesting. And Because, uh, uh sorry, because the the battle, again, is not inside the company. And that is what a leader should do in supply chain. You don't need to fight within the different functions, but you need to bring the different functions together. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And I think that's a common issue in the corporate and the big corporate know that sometimes companies spend too much time in internal battles and discussions instead of being more externally focused which i think is probably what makes companies win at the end of the day yes it's not easy eh? obviously i'm saying that uh, it's easy but it's not Uh, there were many downturns uh, many people i had discussion with 
out of it, uh, I believe that I improved a little bit my diplomacy and my political acumen. You cannot, but end of the day, when you live in supply chain, you cannot make everybody happy. And that is the reality. And my only solution was to show always the reality to everybody, even to the people that I was not making happy, but explaining them why. Yeah. Because that gives a sense of purpose to everybody. Yeah, and I think that that's probably like the key to many like people that are, have strong leadership skills is that they manage to find that balance of, you know, having inf- the right influencing skills and improving themselves, but still being genuine and loyal to their own style and personality, you know? Yeah, but as long as you show the reality and you stand for the good of the company yeah. and you prove yourself to be reliable, you know, salespeople end of the day needs their product and that they need to have a company that is supporting them to make the targets of the company. So as long as they recognize you as an asset, not Mm -hmm. as a problem that is just blaming them for the forecast accuracy, Mm -hmm. then the game is done. Yeah. And there's a few companies that are now, I think more than before, but it's still a very small group of companies that are doing like in their internal succession planning, they're doing more moves between supply chain and sales and vice versa. Do you think that can help bring people to get closer to the table or do you think that that doesn't necessarily add so much value? Well, you're right. In the recent year, I believe we saw Apple, GM, Intel, many companies were at the end of the company were assigned people that uh, had strong experience from supply chain. I believe that that is coming again. I don't like to repeat myself from the fact that uh, selling is always half of the battle. And nowadays the delivery is as important. So before was uh, CEOs coming from sales. Now you have... uh, Many companies, especially industrialized companies, where the supply chain, that is uh, the tricky thing, is uh, a key asset uh, for uh, becoming a CEO. That is what I believe is happening. Mm -hmm. Do you think that maybe more in the consumer goods world where we both work, we will see people like in the future, maybe in five, 10 years, CEOs coming from supply chain or with very heavy supply chain experience because now most CEOs come either from sales, marketing, and sometimes finance more than than supply chain. I see it. Honestly, I see it more and more happening because uh, in the strategy of the consumer companies nowadays, there is more and more direct-to-consumer online marketplaces, all capabilities that cannot disregard uh, half of the solution that is coming from supply chain. So it's not just... uh, how you sell, what you sell, but how you sell. So mm-hmm. all those capabilities, end of the day, constitute an asset that once there is the right person, most probably he can take the helm of the company. He, she can take the helm of the company. Mm-hmm. Do you think that there's anything else that needs to happen maybe in the market or in the mindset of people and leaders for that to become a reality that we see more and more supply chain leaders become CEOs or even GMs? I already know many people that became GMs from supply chain roles. Uh, I believe that is already happening. There are so many people, uh, Intel, GM, Apple, there are so many big companies that are really going in that direction. More and more, the mindset of people that are able to fight the short term with an eye to the long term, with the ability to focus on the profitable growth of the company, anticipating changes, Actually, this is the uh, supply chain is the right uh, job that is preparing you for that mm-hmm. because it requires financial acumen, a business strategy, new product introduction, source making delivery. You're covering quite a lot of uh, SEO job. Do you think that there's any complementary skill that you need to become like a GM or CEO coming from supply chain? I believe political acumen and diplomacy at least I can speak for myself, is something where I should keep on working on. Because like it or not, supply chain is a place where you always create attrition and you always need to bring people together and you are always not making everybody happy. One day is operation, one day is sales, one day is finance. So it's stressing a lot your ability to build up diplomacy because you are always on the hotspot. 
This was Fabio Garzioli at BSH. I hope you enjoyed the show. As always, and as you know, this podcast is done for the community in consumer goods and retail. So any input will be welcome. Feel free to send me a LinkedIn message, email me, you know where to find me and look forward to seeing you again in the next episode. Have a great day.